Last week we talked concerning the beginning of sorrows. Today we want to talk concerning God will shorten the days. God will shorten the days. Matthew chapter 24, verses 8 through 23. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Now let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto him that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray you that your flat be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For men shall then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no place be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. When we look at this, we need to understand that Jesus is speaking to the Jews. He is speaking to the Jews and what they can expect after the church is gone. We are living presently in what biblical scholars tell us that is called the time of the Gentiles or the church age. We're living in a time that Christ is building His church. He is cleansing His bride. And the Bible says that Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. There's coming a time when God will return back to Israel. Israel, because of their disobedience, because they failed to understand that Jesus was their Messiah, and they crucified Him, God turned to the Gentiles. And so if you saw Christendom today, if you saw Christianity today, the bulk of Christians today are Gentiles. Very few Jews. The ones that are believing in Jesus Christ as Messiah are called Messianic Jews. And they worship like Christians. Just like there are Muslims that get saved. And they change their worship day from Friday to Sunday, like the Christians do. Back when I was in the Philippines, I was asked to go to a place called Sultan Kudarat in the very much populated Muslim area. And the word got out that the Filipino-sized white American missionary was coming. What that means was the short missionaries come. And so I was a novelty that they wanted to come and see. And as we ministered to this group, and I didn't know that the majority of them was Muslims, but as I ministered to this group, the power of the Lord with His anointing on His Word began to touch hearts. And these Muslims began to cry and call out to God. When all was said and done, after that week of ministry, I was blessed to baptize over 200 Muslim converts to Christianity. Amen. Amen. They came to me and said, well, do we need to change our worship day from Friday? I said, no, you don't need to. All days are God's day. If you want to worship on Friday, knock yourself out. I said, but now most Christians 
worship on Sunday because we remember on that Sunday the resurrection of our Lord. Every Sunday is a memorial day. It is called the Lord's Day because the Lord arose on the first day of the week. That's why we come to church on Sunday. We could come on Monday. Jesus said of himself that he was the Lord of the Sabbath. So we know that that was changed when Christianity began to grow because Christians gathered on Sunday because the Jews gathered on the Sabbath. And so we became following. And always remember, when you come to this church, we're coming to worship God, but we're coming in memory of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That should always be uppermost in our mind. The cross is empty. The tomb is empty. Amen. But heaven is full of His glory. <laughs> Amen. And so when we look at this, we need to realize that we're going to be raptured. Those who are faithful, believing, and trusting God and have not grown lukewarm in their experience with God and aren't looking for Him. We talk about the church of the Laodiceans who grew lukewarm. We are going to be caught up. And so somebody will ask the question, well, preacher, why do we even need to learn about the tribulation period? We're not going to be here anyway. We will have a front row seat to watch what's going on. But why do we need to learn about it? Number one reason. God, through Jesus Christ, thought it important enough to teach his Jewish disciples that there was going to be a tribulation period. God thought it was important. If that's the only reason we had, that would be the one reason. But two, God thought it so important that he recorded it for history to read about because he placed it in the Bible for us to read about. Reason number two. Third reason, because most Christians are concerned about their families, that they want them saved because they don't want them to die and end up in torment. We ought to realize, too, we don't want them to go through the tribulation period. So the third reason that we, we read about it is we want our loved ones to get saved now and to keep them from the tribulation period. To keep them. Because right now, all the wrath of God came on Jesus Christ when He was on the cross. The wrath for your sin and my sin was put upon Him. He died for our sins so that we don't have to experience the wrath of God. We experience the grace of God. We experience the mercies of God, which is to all that will believe. But there are those who won't. There are those who are even Christians today who scoff at the fact that Jesus is coming again. He is coming again, by the way. But think about it. When Noah preached, he preached for a hundred years. He preached about rain coming, and up to that point, nobody knew what rain was. You go back and read the Old Testament, everything was watered by the dew. By the dew. And here's a man out here who's not a boat builder, this crazy preacher is out there building a boat away from water. Now how's he going to get it to water? So they think, well, this, is, this guy's just a nut. But he's preaching and he's getting his family together. And he's sharing what God said. And he's shared it for 100 years. Until... God opened the heavens and opened the springs onto the earth and it began to rain and began to flood. And on that day, God closed up the ark and nobody else could get in. And they perished. There's coming a day when God says, it's enough. You've trampled underneath the blood of my son too long. You've blasphemed my name too long. You've wiled away your opportunities to get saved. And I have shown you mercy. And I have shown you grace. But I'm going to give you one more chance. You're going to be spewed into tribulation. Along with the Jews. Yes, there are going to be Gentiles saved during the tribulation period. There's a great multitude that comes out of the tribulation period. 
But, thank God, we need to be the Gentiles who are serving God with all our hearts, Amen. fervently, believing in His coming, looking for His coming, and telling our loved ones to help them to escape tribulation, as well as to escape torment. It ought to be a motivation that says, I've got to tell my children they need to get in the ark now. They need to get saved today, for today is the day of salvation. So notice with us this truth. In all judgment, God will always extend grace and mercy to those who will look to Him. Friends, I want to tell you, there's a song that says, I fall down, but I get up. I fall down, but I get up. It's sung by a Christian. And what it simply means is, I have enough sense that when I fall down, I don't stay down. I get right back up for Jesus. I start and I continue to walk for Jesus. I don't lose out with God just because I tripped up. Don't you know you're human and you're subject to make mistakes? And I'm going to go one step further. You're going to make some mistakes. Amen? Because none of us are perfect. Amen. So all of us at some point are going to make mistakes. But aren't you glad that God is a God of mercy? And God is a God of forgiveness. And God is a God that will draw us and reconcile us and forgive us when we repent and turn around and forsake those sins. Yeah. That's all He's looking for. Amen? Mm -hmm. God's not looking for perfect saints because He wouldn't find them in America. He wouldn't find them in the world. That's why we have the church. The church is for the perfecting of the saints and for the saving of the sinner. Amen? And for the healing of the broken heart. So, the church is not just a place we come and worship. There's a purpose in us coming together. We are to build ourselves up in this most holy faith. Amen? We are to encourage one another. We are to strengthen one another. And we have to get in our mindset, we can't lose a one of us. Amen? We've got to do whatever it takes to keep everybody in the ark. And looking for Jesus. And so when we look at this, there's two things that we need to understand. And it's simply this. That the tribulation period comes in two major events. Two major events. The church is gone. The church is raptured. And Paul writes in Thessalonians, Only he that letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Then shall that son of perdition be revealed. Why does he say he says two things. First, only he that letteth will let is a reference to the Holy Spirit. It means to say that when the church goes, the Holy Spirit at the same time is restricted in the work he can do. In the tribulation period, people will be evangelized by the 144,000 sealed Jewish evangelists that we read in the book of Revelations. Their first purpose is to preach to the Jews. To preach to their people. But at the same time, just like when they had the law, and we Gentiles could come into the court to hear, we could become God-fearers. We couldn't come, become Jews, but we could become God-fearers. We could accept the Jewish religion. But now God says, in that time, the Holy Spirit is held back. And the reason that is the church is also going to be gone. And when the church is gone and the Holy Spirit is allowed to be restricted, men will become as evil as they can be. You think these psychotic killers today are bad, you ain't seen nothing yet. Amen. It says that they will kill God's people and think they will do God a service. They think they're killing them in the name of God. You say, is that possible, preacher? Isn't that what Paul said? When Paul was Saul, he said he persecuted the church, he killed the Christians, but he did it because he thought he was doing it in God's name. Do you all remember years ago when the woman was sitting on the organ in church and a man came in and shot her on the organ? And killed her. And when they asked him what was his motivation, he said, I killed her because I was doing God's service. 
See how easy the devil can twist somebody's mind and try to make a lie the truth? Listen, folks. In that day, there's going to be two seals. God first is going to seal the 144,000 Jewish evangelist virgins. The second seal because, you know, the devil's not going to be one of them. He's always counterfeit. There's going to be the unholy trinity. There's going to be the devil, the antichrist, and the false prophet, the unholy trinity. And he then is going to say, hey, anybody don't serve me and take my mark, you can't buy nor sell. And so people, think about it, how easy it is today to stick out their hand and take the mark. How many of you people have been into these places and you don't think a thing about it? And they've got an ink stamp. And you don't think, or you go into uh, Six Flags or any of these other places and they're going to stamp you. You don't think about it. They're even talking about now putting all your information on a microchip. Everything, social security number, medical, the whole nine yards, and inserting it in your hand or in your palm, in your wrist, somewhere on your body, so that when you go traveling throughout the world, all you got to do is put your hand on their scanner and they'll know your passport. They'll know what shots you've taken. They'll know your physical body. They'll know you. In fact, that's being happening right now. That's not future stuff. We're not talking Star Wars stuff. We're talking about stuff right now that they're allowing you to do. In fact, that was one of those things, and I don't know how true it is, but there was one of those things that said you had to be careful when they were going to give you the vaccination because that they were putting stuff in. I don't know that that's true. I don't know that anybody's proven it. But it would be a simple way to get it done. To just put it in a hypodermic, shoot you, and at the same time, shoot a microchip in you. It could happen. And then when you went to the grocery store, guess what? You wouldn't need your wallet. You just put your hand up there. It deduct money from your bank account and put it into their bank account. And people don't think anything about it. They just, you know, here it is. Friends, we need to think about these things. We need to think about where our world is going to and see them as signs of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We need to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We need to have our eyes open. The beginning of sorrows is also known as the time of Jacob's troubles and the lesser tribulation. It is during the tribulation period that is divided into two periods, the lesser tribulation and the great tribulation. You read about this in Daniel 9.27, Daniel 7.25, and Daniel 12.7. The lesser tribulation will be time of betrayal and persecution for the Jews and anyone who names the name of Jesus. Again, let me encourage you. You won't be here for that if you're being faithful, if you're praying, if you're allowing your spirit to listen for the trumpet call. Amen? What am I telling you? Don't get so bogged up in the troubles of life that your eyes are on the troubles and not on, on the one who can solve your troubles. Amen? Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes and your faith on God. You will never be left outside if you keep your faith there. You'll never be fooled. You'll never be disappointed. You'll never be disheartened. If you keep your faith in God and keep your faith in Jesus Christ. So, there's the beginning of sorrows. False prophets will arise and deceive many. Now notice this. Sin will be rampant and the love of many shall wax cold. The reason sin will be rampant is because the church is not there to show a standard. 
The reason that sin will be rampant is the Holy Spirit will not be allowed to convict people of their sins. Like it's happening today. So we need to understand the only way they're going to get saved and keep saved in the tribulation period is to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. To believe what He did. But then to make it, they're going to end up dying. They're going to end up having their heads cut off or some way the Antichrist will kill them. And so we don't want to be here. Amen? We don't want to be around. Listen, how many of you would want to be around in a war? Nobody. Nobody likes war. Well, friends, we really don't want to be around when evil is fighting against good. We want to be out of here. Amen? The gospel will be preached in all nations by God's messengers and the angels. Now, for a long time, people preached that the, the gospel had to be preached in all nations by the church. And Jesus would then come. But that's not what the Bible says. If you keep the Bible in context, yes, it is the church's duty, duty to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And we have reached out into the world through TV, through radio, through tracts, through missionaries. But if you read the book of Revelation, you find there that there is an angel. And God will send that angel out to preach the glorious gospel to the entire world. So what are you saying, Brother? The gospel not having been preached to the whole world right now is not anything keeping Jesus back. Okay? It will be done, but it will be done during the tribulation period, and we'll be out of here. We'll be gone. So we need to understand this as we look into these scriptures to realize that God will get the work done. Read Revelation chapter 7, verse 3 through 8, and Revelation 14, 6. And that will tell you about the angel who's going to be sharing the gospel. Along with the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Now, the lesser tribulation will conclude with the revealing of the Antichrist. The first part of the tribulation is the Antichrist setting up his kingdom. It will relatively be a time of peace. That's how he gets to his power. He will make a covenant with Israel and allow Israel to continue their worship. And because he will be a Jew, the Israelites will listen to him. The Jewish people will listen to him. They'll be deceived. He'll write a covenant with them. Tell them they can worship. They'll rebuild the temple in troublous times. And they will restart the sacrifice. This happens in the tribulation time. Less of tribulation. But in the middle of the week, and it takes Daniel to tell us that the tribulation period is divided into three and a half years and three and a half years. But in the middle of the week, the Antichrist will desecrate the temple just like Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes, before the destruction of the first temple, went and killed a pig on the altar of God. And of course, a pig is an unclean animal, and he desecrated the house of God. Well, the Antichrist is going to one-up him. He's going to set up his own image in the temple and require everybody to worship him in the middle of the week. It is at that time that the Jewish nation will know that they have been fooled because he will break the covenant. He will desecrate their temple. And he will show that he, empowered by the devil, wants to be God. And he wants everybody to bow down and worship him. The lesser tribulation will end 
The second phase began, which is the Great Tribulation. In the Great Tribulation, that is when the Antichrist begins a full-blown war against the saints. A full-blown war. It is at this time when they're doing this that Jesus is going to come back to fight the battle of Armageddon. The Jews are instructed to flee to the mountains for safety. And they are told not to do it on the Sabbath day. Because on the Sabbath day there was only a distance that they could go. So he says that you can flee any other day because you don't have any distance limitations on the other days. On the Sabbath day, you can only walk a Sabbath distance. So he says, flee to the mountains for your safety. This will be the greatest thing that has ever occurred because the wrath of God will be completely released on all mankind. At this time, because man refused Jesus Christ, because they refused His death and resurrection, because they trampled underneath the blood of Christ, and because they did not humble themselves, God will allow unrepentant mankind to undergo all of his wrath. You'll find out one third of human ma mankind is killed. One third of the stars fall. One third of the waters are polluted. The animals die. God's wrath is poured out. Thank God we'll be watching from heaven. Amen. Amen. The Antichrist will rise to power through what appears to be the exhibition of miracles. The Antichrist, it seems, will be shot, and they think that it will be a, look like a mortal wound, but he lives through it. When he lives through that, they think he now is the Messiah. He is the one. And it's through the miracles. Listen, folks. Miracles are real. God still does miracles. Okay? But God never ordained people chasing after miracles. God never ordained people running from here to pillar to post to try to get a miracle. Folks, if you need a miracle, you can get it right here in this local church. You can get any kind of miracle right here through the prayers of the saints through the faith of the saints. God will honor your prayers just as much as anyone that says they've got a healing campaign. Amen? And I've seen a lot of people healed. I've seen a lot of people who were lame walk again. I've seen a lot of people with leprosy cleansed. I'm talking about on the mission field, people believe the Word, and you see miracles. Over here, it's sad to say, Americans have educated them so much They've educated themselves out of miracles. You see, faith simply says, I don't quite understand it, but because God says it, I believe it. <laughs> I don't understand what all God's doing. I don't understand all God's way, but I know if God's doing it, and it's God's way, it must be right, and therefore, I do believe it. And when you do that, guess what? You're a candidate for miracles. When it gets to the place that you accept this holy word of God as God's revelation of Himself and the mind of Christ, and that this word of God is for you and for me, and the same God that did it yesterday will do it today and will do it forever. He does not change. Finally, this morning, the Bible says God will shorten the days for the elect. And these elects are the Jews and those Gentiles who accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. What days is He going to shorten? The tribulation period. It says He's going to shorten those days. Otherwise, nobody would be saved. So He says, in the midst of my judgment, in the midst of my wrath, I'm still going to show mercy and grace and those who turn to me, I will shorten the days for their sake. And they'll be my people too. What have we learned? First off, the thing we've learned is we don't want to be around here in tribulation period. 
second thing we learn, if we really love our loved ones, we don't want our loved ones around here during the tribulation period. Amen? Not only do we want them not to lose out with God and burn in a lake of fire, we don't want them to experience the full wrath of God. And so now, today, is the day of salvation. Today, we live like Christians. Today, we live a life that is a witness that they will want our Jesus. That they will want our life in Jesus Christ. That they will want to serve our Master. How sad will it be one day if one of our children were to come up to us and say, Daddy, Mommy, had you lived right, I might have made it too. Amen. We have got to reach out. Now us gray-headed folk, we have a really heavy burden on us. Because not only are we responsible to reach out to our children, we're responsible to reach out to our children's children. We're supposed to reach out to our children's children's children. Amen? We can be proud of our great, 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 great grandchildren. I like when Sister Sarah used to say that. She was so proud of her great, 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 great grandchildren. But if we love them, we share Jesus with them. You say, but they might get mad at me. They probably will. The Bible says that they will be offended. They probably will. But hey, if your grandma and your grandpa, or if your mom and daddy, guess what? The love that you've shown throughout the years will bring them right 